thank you so much, ladies, for saying yes. And I'd like to begin with, with Nicole Fleetwood, whose book is Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. I'm really sad that we weren't able to do our event in March, but I look forward to us being together in person um, at some point. It was really important for me to launch the book um, with a conversation um, that involved Mary Baxter, Asia Johnson, and Michelle Jones because of their incredible art and activism, specifically around the impact of mass incarceration on the lives of Black women. Um, and uh, my book, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration, actually starts with me talking about um, how I learned um, practices of collective care and survival by watching the women in my family support our incarcerated relatives. Ma mass incarceration impact Black women in so many ways. Um, one, the, uh, the disproportionate um, arrest and sentencing of Black women with about 29 to 30% of um, women prison population being Black women, although we make up 6 to 7% of the general population. It's even more extreme when you look at the um, uh, confined youth, incarcerated young people. Um, young Black girls are about 35% of um, the population in, in juvenile facilities. Um, and I'm just quoting from, the, from prisonpolicy.org, which does a lot of great research on um, the toll of mass incarceration. It says, while society and the justice systems subject all girls to stricter codes of conduct than is expected of their male peers, Black girls in particular shoulder an added burden of adultification, being perceived as older, more culpable, and more responsible than their peers, which leads to greater contact with, with and harsher consequences within the juvenile justice system. So those are just some of the ways, but um, I also think in my, in my own research and teaching about um, the, the kind of minute ways that we're impacted by mass incarceration, even if we've never been arrested or in jail, in terms of the disproportionate ways that we support incarcerated relatives, how it, um, you know, it's part of extractive capitalism that's taking wealth and resources out of Black communities, Black homes, um, how it burdens Black women often being the, the only um, income provider in their homes, also often the only child care provider, um, and so all the ways that it impacts the, the life outcomes um, and viability of life for, for Black women. Um, and with that said, I want to introduce um, our, um, my friends and people I, I love being in conversation with around these issues. Um, they're all artists, activists, and educators, um, directly impacted women who have a lot to share and to teach us all. Um, about how we end mass incarceration and how we even move, you know, more expensively to a world without prisons. And we all have kind of different ideas about what abolition means. So I'm hoping we can maybe talk a little bit about that too. Um, but I'm gonna do brief um, introductions and then let them tell us more about their work and their experiences. So Mary Enoch Elizabeth Baxter, we've known each other for a few years and we've collaborated, collaborated on a few programs. Um, she is a Right of Return Fellow. She's also a, a Reimagining Reentry Fellow with the Mural Arts Philadelphia. Um, she is a sound artist, a film artist, um, and, and just does incredible work. Um, she's really active on the scene right now in Philadelphia with um, the National Bailout for Mom Mother's Day and also with um, responding to the COVID-19 um, 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 crisis. Asia Johnson lives in Detroit, and she is a bell disruptor. She, last time we were on a call, to, she couldn't be there because she was at the Detroit jail trying to bail, get women out of jail. And she'll tell us more about that work. She's also a filmmaker, a writer, and a performer. And Michelle Jones and I met two years ago in Mexico when we were at a, a research institute together. She had just finished her first year of a prestigious PhD program at NYU. Um, she's from Indiana. She's currently in, in Indiana, and she's between New York and Indiana these days for research. Um, she's also a writer, a performer, and a visual artist, um, and a historian who's working on uh, a, a collective history of prisons, of women's prisons in Indiana, working with women, friends of hers who are still in prison. 
So we'll start with Mary, then Asia, and then Michelle. I think you're muted, Mary. Thanks, Nicole, for those wonderful introductions. Um, I want to give a special thank you to Harlem Stage for, for providing us with this platform uh, so we can talk about this much needed conversation. Um, I've always considered myself an artist. Um, I just didn't have the resources or guidance uh, to, nurture those, to nurture those talents. But um, I've always considered um, myself an artist and used art to uh, process you know, my experiences and also find ways uh, to heal and share meaningfully. Uh, my art and practice centers around my personal lived experience with incarceration um, and the need to reimagine my own narrative um, for empowerment and healing. Um, my work is centered around the intersections of reproductive justice, motherhood, crime and punishment. And um, my most recent work uh, is a triptych detailing my life before, during, and after incarceration entitled Ain't I a Woman, um, which really dives into my experience of giving birth while shackled. Um, I was handcuffed and shackled for 43 hours while in labor with my first child. And um, really raising awareness and also using this film um, as a call to action uh, to get policy shifted um, and let people know that this um, archaic practice is still going on, still legal in over 20 states um, in America. Um, my main mediums are music, hip hop, um, particularly, uh, film and text. And um, it's really also a call to reimagine um, the encouragement of mothers bonding with their children um, despite being incarcerated um, and strengthening families through uh, trauma-specific care and rehabilitation um, and moving from a system that's not punitive, uh, but a system um, that really allows for restorative justice um, and also stop calling on a prison system to, to solve societal issues. Um, that's one of the key components of my activism. Um, my work has also shifted into helping other impacted women, particularly at Riverside Corrections, uh, through an initiative um, with Art for Justice and Mural Arts Philadelphia. I was going in weekly prior to COVID-19 and conducting a creative writing course where women leveraged their own narrative um, for healing, um, for personal you know, empowerment, but also um, to raise awareness to the issues um, that affect women, uh, particularly in the carceral system, because it's important to note that prisons weren't designed with women in mind. Um, so um, I, uh, along with other um, impacted women at Riverside and upstate at Muncie, along with women on the outside that have been impacted, co-authored some legislation uh, last April that was introduced um, to really tackle um, things like providing uh, free feminine hygiene products. A lot of times women have to choose between a phone call home and you know taking care of themselves. Um, also uh, making sure that women aren't uh, put in facilities too far away from the children, um, from their children, um, so that there's, uh, you know, a maintenance of that connection because a lot of times when you remove a woman from the community in this way, um, you're essentially incarcerating um, the, the entire community. Um, and, that's, and this is how the cycles of incarceration um, continue when the children do not have uh, care, their caregiver um, in their lives. So that's a little bit about the work that I do. Sorry. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Nicole, for inviting us amazing, like I call us amazing women because we're all Black, we're all impacted, and we are all doing something that is meaningful and it's been difficult it's sometimes difficult for black women to find meaning and that was what my issue was prior to my incarceration was finding meaning um i always considered myself a writer but i didn't co correlate that with art 
I was obsessed with people like Audre Lorde and even Sylvia Plath who took deeply personal experiences and had the courage to like put them on the forefront and tell people about some of their deepest, darkest issues. And then making the political personal. Um, so I was always writing, always writing about how I was feeling. And I always found it very selfish that everything was about me, me, me. And it wasn't until I got to prison at 23 years old that my writing shifted to things that were bigger than me. Um, I stopped writing about love because love was what got me in the situation that I was in. And love was love for a man was part of the reason why I ended up in prison. And I knew that it was going to take love for myself um, to get out of prison. And while I was incarcerated, I began to explore other other mediums. I wasn't the best at visual art. And everyone would tell me like, no, that that's great. And I'm like, no, it just doesn't feel right to me. I feel most comfortable expressing myself through words. And I feel like I connect more to people when I'm writing. And so my writing ended up getting better and better and better. And I started getting published while inside. And that had never been something that I had been able to accomplish before prison. And so I was getting these accomplishments, but I was still defining myself by the fact that I was incarcerated. So it took a lot of writing about things outside of the carceral state for me to start defining myself by the fact that I was writing and the fact that I did have a life after this and that I had the second chance. And the women that I was intertwined with every single day, waking up to these women, spending days with these women, and that it wasn't an us and them. It was all of us in this together, in this struggle. And I learned so much about empathy and compassion and forgiveness. And I wrote about those things. And it, it, opened, it opened my heart and it opened my art. Can you um, tell us what the Right of Return project is? Both you and Mary uh, mentioned it. So when I came home, uh, I got a link um, from one of my publishers uh, that said, you should apply to this right of return. Uh, it's, some, it's a thingy, like she, she's an older white woman who doesn't know anything about criminal justice. Um, she's like, it's a thing for people who've been in prison and, and you should apply. And so I looked it up and it's, it's to support formerly incarcerated artists and you get you get money of course which is good but you get to make a statement with your art and sometimes we don't have the resources to like mary spoke to the fact that when she was younger she didn't have a family that cultivated her artistry or the money to like go out and buy the materials that you need or books like books are so important and sometimes your, your family can't buy you books or you don't have, to, if you just got out of prison, the last thing you're thinking about is going out and buying a $30 hardcover book. So this um, grant gave us the money to A, you know, take care of ourselves, but also to finance a project that will make a meaningful impact on mass incarceration. So every year they pick six, well, I think in our fellowship, uh, Michelle, it was six of us. And I was a 2019 fellow you, we got $20,000, and with that $20,000, I mean, you, you literally can change the world with $20,000 in the, in the realm of mass incarceration and doing something that is going to change hearts and minds and make policy changes and things that are so shrouded in darkness. Um, our projects are shedding light on on something that needs to be in the light. And that's what Nicole's book has done. It's totally torn down a wall between us and them, the world and the people who are inside. It's always like such a distinction between those behind the barbed wire and those outside of the barbed wire. But art has a way of bringing people together because there is no us and them in the art. In art. There was a statistic that you mentioned, Nicole. Um, I think it was one in five. Uh, one in five people have someone in their family or someone that they know intimately that has been incarcerated. I think your mic is muted. 
Thank you. Sorry. And I was telling Asia that was a beautiful. Asia, you, there was a line in there. Oh, you know, you said something. You said the political is personal, which it, usually we say the personal is, but I really love change switching that around. It, that's very, very powerful. The political is personal. Um, and Jesse mentioned during the talk that one and two people have, have, have a relative or know someone in prison or who've been imprisoned. So we're living in a society of, you know, mass criminalization, ma like just hyper incarceration, especially of certain populations. Everyone's not impacted the same way. You know, many of us are disproportionately impacted, but it's so broad sweeping for us to not, um, for us to still have this kind of us them mentality around it. We're all impact, we're all in some ways impacted. Um, and I think that's partly what Asia is saying, what I hear her saying um, in terms of, um, you know, getting, uh, moving society to get closer to like really accountability. You know, before it's prison, I never could imagine a world where there wasn't jails and prisons, but since I've come home, I do imagine a world where there are where there are no jails and prisons where instead of those spaces, we have spaces where people can grow and heal. And if you have harm society, that doesn't mean that you're caged. I mean, that doesn't mean that you should be put in a cell and forgotten about. And I think we all, everybody on this call knows that. But I don't think, it's like incarceration, like Mary was saying, is so ingrained in our society that it is the automatic go-to. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is, absolutely. Um, and Michelle, how are you? Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Michelle Daniel Jones, and I recently got married. Um, and I do thank Harlem Stage for this opportunity. And I'm so grateful to be here with Mary and Asia, powerhouse women doing this work and, and, and the team. And I just thank Nicole for inviting us. Um, so when I was a little girl, I wanted to be Debbie Allen. I thought Debbie was all of that. She could dance, she could write, she could produce. She was an artist and I thought, if I could be anybody in the world, I wanted to be Debbie Allen. And I've always grown up around art. My mother's an abstract painter. She was the first person in my family to get a bachelor's degree from at all, but she also got it from an art school, an art college, Heron School of Art in Indiana, Indianapolis. And so I've always had that energy, that creative spark and spirit around me. Um, and it's, all, it's been pretty much how I live in the space. I'm always thinking about things creatively. And it's, it's just pretty much from my early foundation. Um, a little bit about the work that I'm doing. Um, first of all, I am a right of return fellow as, you, as, as the other two wonderful ladies are. And I'm also a reimagining fellow with Mary with Mural Arts. And I'm really excited about the opportunity to kind of take my research that I've done on collateral consequences of criminal convictions, that I've done on stigma, how it, uh, on weaponized stigma and biographic mediation and turn those into artistic projects so that they can be shared and embraced by larger audiences. Because one of my main arguments and one of the things I don't like about academics is they have a tendency to speak to and write for one another. And they have sort of siloed arguments amongst each other, yet, they have powerful information based on their very detailed research that only gets consumed in the academic sphere. I, and with my whole total being, that was one of the reasons why I almost did not want to go to graduate school because of that practice. But I was around some people in my artist community inside prison who helped me think about why it doesn't have to be that way. And so the project that, um, uh, I work on several projects, but the one that I would like to talk about right now is the project that I did for Soze, which is called the Point of Triangulation Project. And the whole, pro the whole premise of that is that I was creating something that wasn't for the consumption of formerly incarcerated people or people who had been in prison or, or highlighting people who had been in prison as, as, a, as an object. The entire audience, the person I'm trying to get to with the Point of Triangulation Project is the observer. 
is the person who is able to impute, stigmatize, weaponize stigma against formerly incarcerated people. And so if you can imagine a triangle, on the left side of the triangle I created, um, uh, we took photography of people in carceral clothing, you know, white standard white t-shirts, sweats, and, and white shoes. And on the right side, we took photography of people in their places of power with their children or with props or whatever they thought was that totally embodied who they were. And we drew a red line on the floor. And on that red line, I'm asking the observer, the person who weaponizes stigma against the former incarcerated, is look at the person on the left in the eye. The photography was life size, five foot tall, but at the height of the eyes, because I wanted you to look in their eyes on the left, see what it means to be incarcerated and look on the left and look on the right and see if you, how you impute stigma on them the moment you know that person's been incarcerated. Because that photo looks like it could be come out of a magazine, be anywhere. But what happens to the individual on the line when they begin to impute implicit or explicit bias against a person who's been incarcerated? That seems to be a driver of a lot of my work, is I want the average person to recognize their role, their role in keeping mass incarceration running. Because we can point to legislators and we can point to prosecutors and we can point to judges and we can point to all kinds of groups, but the individual plays a role. Why? Because social consequences of criminal convictions are bigger than legal consequences. The socials come out of my everyday experience. I can go, because I want a dog, go to a rescue shelter to, to seek out a dog, but I have to check a box with a, which would eliminate my ability, my access to that opportunity. And that's just a small way in which societal social consequences of criminal convictions actually clamp down and lock out opportunity. And they're coming not from laws and legislation, they're coming from the social fabric of our, our, of our communities. and so. A lot of my work is wanting to get people to confront that, right? Um, same thing with the History Project. In the inside, we got a hold of primary source data of the first prison in the United States, which would happen to be the prison that we were incarcerated in. The people who founded that prison were Quakers, and they believe, and the narratives that had been told about them were benevolent. But as we delved into the research as with a fine eye through the lens of being incarcerated. In other words, we privileged our experience of incarceration to look at an archive with a certain vision. Doing so, we realized that they weren't telling the complete full story of these benevolent, quote unquote, benevolent reformers. And what did we find? We found waterboarding. We found practices of which they were stripping girls, women and girls naked and hosing them down and, um, to discipline them. We found all kinds of procedures of locking girls in closets with no lights and leaving them there on bread and water diets. And this was the, this was the star of prison reform in the country at the turn of the century. And so again, my work is all about getting the average person to kind of reflect on, the, on their practices and processes, look a little deeper, refine your lens and recognize the roles in which you are playing the roles that we are all playing as individuals in keeping mass incarceration, mass incarceration. It is a choice and we can make a new choice anytime we get ready. And, I, and that's what I try to challenge people to do with my work. Thank you, that was powerful. Monique, do you want to chime in and ask, say anything or ask any questions before we move on? I, I think it's fascinating that um, the first prison was founded by Quakers and not to disparage the Quaker community at all, but we also see the Quakers as being integral to the Underground Railroad. So for mm -hmm. me, it just shows the complexity of humanity and that this idea of us and them is just something that we need to work um, feverishly on eliminating. But I think and, that complexity is important, right? Can we because just, no sorry. one is, go ahead. I just want us to be, so we're historic, so we're accurate. You, um, Michelle was talking about the first women's prison. Women's prison. The first women's gotcha. prison 
prison in Indiana. The first prison that is well, often people call it Walnut Street Jail in Philadelphia, which is a right. hyper incarcerated place. Whole other story. <laughs> so so um, Michelle was telling us the story of the first women's prison. Yeah. And the Quakers were considered modern reformers, progressive and in every sense of the word going to be less barbaric than the ways that people have been disciplined previously, right? These are all the kind of ideals that go into it that in reality we know. Right. The story is much more complex, right? Um, that there are motivations, there, there are things motivating behavior that are often left out of the historical record. And when we can do those deeper dives, um, we recognize those people are not that different from anybody else, right? We try to hold those up to be benevolent, perfect in every way, but they are humans and they were challenged being the first prison for women to be perfect in every way without spot or blemish. They were women running a facility on their own without the assistance of men. They were under the, the microscope of, of, of the society to see if they could do it. And so they couldn't allow anybody to get to, to, they couldn't allow any, any reflection of them that wasn't perfect. And so that meant that when girls disagreed with the ways in which they, the facility was ran, they dealt with them in a certain way. They just chose some of the similar violences that we see today have, that, that have been continuous throughout all carceral systems, right? right. I also wanted to um, respond or ask you to talk a little bit about the nuance of weaponized stigma. It's the first time I'm hearing that term and right. how just the average citizen yes. weaponizes stigma and right. we may not so, even know it, be aware right. of, of, of our behavior in that way. Absolutely. So stigma is something that you, that, that I can have. It's a, pre, it's a prejudice. It's a, it's a, a prejudice towards a, towards a person or thing, right? Um, but stigma becomes, an, it's a prejudice that is enacted to become stigma when it impacts a person that has been stigmatized, right? And so you may have, you may feel a certain way about people who have certain cases, or you may feel a certain way about people who have, um, who've been incarcerated, or who've been in jail, or who smoke, or who believe in abortion, or whatever and you will respond to those certain people with, with your negative energy or your negative thoughts, or your negative feelings. You're gonna, you're gonna have a stigma against that individual. When it becomes weaponized, right, is when that stigma is activated on, at the social level, which actually curtails opportunity and access for those people, right? Because I can stigmatize you and it may not affect your day to day. It becomes weaponized when I can change, when, when you affect my day to day living. When you can keep me from, for example, my example of getting a dog from a shelter, when you can keep me from, um, uh, keep me from serving as, as a PTA or serving as a kid's coach for um, my children or, or my nieces or serving in some kind of way. It becomes weaponized when it can stop access to resources and opportunity. Thank you. That was all three of you. Very powerful. And I, I feel like you already started answering the question that I want to ask. I don't, and I don't want this to be a form. It doesn't have to be a formal um, kind of conversation, but you're all talking about like direct experience being directly impacted. Um, and part of what like we came together to think about is the, it's just like in rigorous ways and also like personal ways, like, how prisons impact black women. Like what's, what, like some of the specificity around like its impact on black women. Um, and Asia, you said that you framed it as like you're, this is a community, it's a community right here, right? Like when you see Mary and Michelle, there's some mirroring and recognition that can take place that's very powerful. Anyone can speak to that. Asia, you wanna? Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, being, I think that being a black woman is without any type of privilege. And then you throw being formerly incarcerated or currently incarcerated and we're automatically thrown to the wayside. Whenever we walk into a room, 
it's now, I'm not just a woman walking into this room, but I am a black woman who's formerly incarcerated. And now I have to explain this. We're always thinking about how we're going to explain this to people, whether it's to an employer, it's to a room full of uh, legislators or to a potential partner in dating. Um, it, it, we don't want to define ourselves by it, yet society is going to ask those questions, those tough questions that sometimes we want to get away from, but you can never put distance between you and being a Black incarcerated woman or formerly incarcerated woman. And so, and, not, and there are all these, like I was talking about the labels, and some people don't like to be referred to as formerly incarcerated, but maybe justice impacted or um, a returning citizen, which implies that we have all the rights that a citizen does, but I'm not going to even get into that because we don't. But like when checking those boxes that we have to check in every single environment, whether it's adopting a dog or getting a job or getting a husband or a wife, checking those boxes, like the community, this is why this community and coming together is so important so that we know that somebody has, somebody has our back, so to speak, that we're not alone. And being in prison is one of the loneliest experiences that one can go through. And you, you have to make your own community, even if your community is you and a bunch of books around you or your artwork hanging around the cell. Community is, we have to make our own community now because we don't have one to enter back into that's willing to embrace us as, as accepting as Soze was or Writer Return was or Nicole, you are. There, there aren't that many people out there like that. And that's why Harlem Stage, thank you. I forgot to thank you in my introduction, but thank you so much because you're putting this on a platform that a lot of people who aren't um, knowledgeable about this topic, they're going to walk away from this and maybe have a different outlook on it. You know, and I just... It's a big uh, and important subject. We see the face, the public face of men. And we have empathy for them because we've talked about them in uh, you know the culture for so long and I have four brothers and all four of them have been incarcerated uh, my dad was incarcerated so I'm a person who grew up going to prisons with my mother but I never had a vision until Really, Nicole, I mean, it sounds ignorant, but I really didn't have a face of women in prison. So even mm -hmm. if my brothers would have girlfriends that would, you know, might go to jail for a moment or back and forth, it seemed as though, or maybe we kind of talked about it as, oh, they just got off the wrong track for a minute, but they're coming back because they're a woman. Like, we never really kind of processed the population of women in prison. Um, so. The other point that I just wanted to bring to bear is um, in terms of the stigma and academia, having the conversation in academia and why I'm so excited about Nicole, not just because she's my neighbor, we live in the same neighborhood, but because I always saw her as an academic. And I was really surprised when she shared her own history, family history with this uh, subject matter and now the book and then connecting it with art, it's the perfect um, intersection of art and activism and culture and community that Harlem Sage wants to be a part of. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm just inspired uh, by you all. And let's hear from Mary for a minute and then we'll mm -hmm. just to get, make sure we get everyone's voices in. Yeah, um, that's pretty much how the National Bellout Org um, came to be was out of this need to protect and advocate um, on the behalf of Black women that are incarcerated. Um, to N Nicole's point earlier about the, the criminalization of Black girls in childhood and the rates of incarceration being higher and victimization um, being higher and the way that society responds. Um, a lot of times, um, Black girls aren't allowed to be children. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's this weight um, that you have to do everything right the first time. There's no leeway to make mistakes. Um, 
And we're pretty much an afterthought, especially when you factor in just the, the patriarchal society that we live in. Um, so we, we're being oppressed for our gender, but as well as our race, um, which leaves us very vulnerable um, to these systems. Um, and, you know, I just have to commend National um, Black um, Bella Org, which is a black led organization of activists, lawyers, um, queer folks uh, that just said, no, we're going to um, utilize the tradition of black people buying their own freedom, which is birthed out of the legacy of slavery, which, you know, mass incarceration has metamorphosized into um, this legalized slavery and policing of, of black people. Um, and just say, look, you know, black love is gonna get these folks out. And um, I just want to note that over 17,000 donations, all from community members, like there's no large backing foundations. This is like mutual aid, like in real time. And um, they chose, you know, Mother's Day because, you know, we care about our community. Um, and that's another narrative that we have to combat that black people just don't care. And I think that this movement is a testament that no, we do care and we are gonna do something about it and we're not gonna wait on legislation and policy. Um, we're gonna do what we can do right now. Supportive services for when the women um, caregivers are bailed out so to help them sustain their freedom, um, whether it's keeping them digitally connected during this COVID-19 crisis or providing like rental assistance, um, and, and all the other things that folks need, um, job placement, resume writing, um, to really just, you know, give folks the support and resources they need uh, to not only stay free, but um, I'm rambling now, sorry. <laughs> Michelle, okay, I'm gonna ask you uh, this question, the same question, but I'm gonna ask you to connect it to some, because to kind of help us tra transition. Um, so I wanna know, I know this is very much connected to your research, thinking about how prisons impact black women specifically. And then if you can mention some of the organizations and initiatives that you're working with, Michelle, I want to hear from all of you because that's one of the things that I, Monique and I were talking about beforehand is like really providing resources and the names of organizations that for people to get involved. And um, Mary was talking about the National Bailout and also the Dignity Now Act. Did I say it right? Is it Dignity Now Act? Mary, did it, is that correct? Dignity Act Now Collective. Thank you. Dignity Act Now Collective and uh, the Philadelphia Bell Fund, um, who we all work in conjunction with each other. So can you, uh, Michelle, tell us about some of, because I know you've started, you've co-founded some initiatives also. Right. Um, so, um, I wanted to find this for you. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So, to Asia's po earlier point and Mary, I think one of the things that we also have to combat as black women incarcerated and formerly incarcerated is this tendency to make to, to, to black exceptionalism. And so when we see black women doing well, they have a tendency to single you out as the singular black woman doing well and, and try to progress that as opposed to re, uh, uh, connecting that to community, right? Um, I never allowed that to happen. I still, I have people on my phone list when we call and I stay connected to my community, my incarcerated community of women. And then as soon as I got out, I found my community in Indianapolis and I built a wonderful community of former incarcerated people in New York. Um, through Beyond the Bars, but um, I think it's important that we stamp down that narrative that just because you see few Black women in that space does not mean that you, that few Black women are the only women who are capable, right? We need to emphasize that there has been an act, there's active processes that deny access to resources and opportunity. Because if you gave people opportunity, they would show up, right? And um, I come, I come, I come back that a lot because people in, in my situation they try to act as if 
I must my myself and some other folks are like golden unicorns and that we're the only people that exist. And so I refute that, and I also encourage everyone else to do what Mary and, and Asia are, and 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 Nicole always emphasizes that we are a global we are a community, a global community. And with that said. Um, the organizations that I'm currently working with now is Justice for Women COVID Task Force, uh, um, based in New York, and uh, we're meeting monthly, uh, weekly, to work on strategies to and women are in danger, um, and and there are a couple women on ventilators right now, and there is need to get involved. Um, the other pro uh, the other New York based projects that I'm working on is DBG DBSJA. And that's the Domestic Violence um, Injustice Act that has um, that is that that was passed, and now it requires that work to go back to all those women who are eligible for release, who are eligible to have their sentences reconsidered, to do all of their background work and and actual file paperwork to get those people out. That's a project I'm really excited. New project that I've just jumped on to to offer all any skills and. Um, that I can offer. And then I'm also on the board of Worth Rises and Worth Rises launches campaigns specifically, number one, to get corporations to divest their monies in uh, their retirement plans and otherwise in organizations that prop up and support mass incarceration. In addition, Worth Rises is active in uh, campaigns in New York and other states, particularly in California, to get prisons to offer free phone calls and free video calls for incarcerated people, particularly during this COVID uh, time. Um, and then I would say my last initiative is the one that's kind of almost closest to my heart. It is the Constructing Our Future. I'm board chair of Constructing Our Future in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, and it was a reentry, it's a reentry program that was created and designed by women for women it, while we were all incarcerated in, in Indiana Women's Prison. Slowly, we've trickled out and we've come to the organization to do the work. We are very happy right now because we have a professional organization that is helping to set up our organizational structure, capacity building, fundraising building, and we're ready to step off and start offering transitional housing for women, we pray, by the end of this year. Because we rec recognize that for in our state, the number one thing that women do not have is safe, affordable, healthy housing. And, um, and, and that community support that we want to continue. One of the best things that we have to keep that connected is that we have a personal Facebook group that is 800 strong of, of formerly incarcerated women in the state of Indiana. And we use that community to crowdsource um, our reentry app that we're developing, as well as to survey, survey the women in the, who, are, who, who are directly in need about what they need, what would they they'd like to see. With 800 voices able to respond to a singular issue in your state, it's a very powerful resource, and we're very, very grateful to have that in our state. Nicole, you're muted. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you for that. Um, so, what I'm I'm going to ask you now, um, and it's um, to think about the work you're doing as it relates right now to COVID. 19 and I know that you all have been on the ground um, and so we'll start Asia we'll start with you um, and tell us about what you're doing in Detroit and just tell us a little bit about the scene in Detroit because I saw today that per capita the deaths in Detroit have have actually topped New York City of course it's the population is much smaller but that it's a really it's an epicenter that doesn't get nearly as much attention as for example New York City unmute sorry um here in michigan we have one prison for women just one and in that prison they hold about 2200 women it was really designed to hold about 800 women so it's constantly overcrowded they've had 79 cases of covid uh three deaths uh three women that i knew very well and uh 10 are in the hospital currently and our governor hasn't said much about releasing people that are in prison. Um, so the jails have decarcerated as much as, as much as looks good on paper. 
Um, but every week I'm in the jail twice a week. I work for a national nonprofit called the Bell Project and we post bail for those who can't afford to post it for themselves. And actually it's just criminalizing poverty, like Mary said. Um, we don't think that anybody should be in jail simply because they can't afford to get out. And it disproportionately affects black and brown people. Um, it's not fair that this person is sitting in jail on $500 bond and this person has $500 to get out, go home to their family, keep their job, keep their home, keep custody of their children. And so every week that, that that's what I'm on the ground doing. I'm really trying to stay connected to the women in the prisons because a lot of the deaths and a lot of the, the positive cases are not in the media. Um, they're not reporting it. And so I have to keep on top of it by talking to the women inside, even though I'm technically not supposed to talk to women inside because I'm still on parole until October. Um, but it's important to my work. It's important to, to know that just, it wasn't too long ago that that's where I was sitting. And when I was there, the worst thing that could have happened is a scabies outbreak. And this is a life or death situation. And I have to wrestle with being grateful that I'm not there, but being torn and having the empathy and knowing what those women must be going through. And so Detroit is definitely a hot spot. I have to go in the jails with my mask and my gloves. They take your temperature before you go into the jail, um, but they aren't doing enough. And I don't think anyone's doing enough for incarcerated people. And is it your opinion that the underreporting is across the country? In absolutely absolutely and one of the things that they don't talk about is that if i was in prison and i had symptoms i would not be forthcoming about those symptoms for fear of uh getting segregated being by myself not being that getting the adequate health care that i need but the pun being punished for being sick so I think that a lot of the a lot of the positive cases that there are more and people just don't want to come forward. And the people that have died were people that did not come forward with their symptoms mm -hmm. in the women's prison. Those three women, they they were scared. And so you know that they more than likely infected, uh, you know, not intentionally, but that other people got sick as a result. Absolutely. Uh, Mary, Mary, do you want to tell us about what's happening in Philadelphia? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, it's pretty much how um, Asia has described it. Um, but I think it's also we should note that the way that inmates are being infected, um, nine times out of ten is coming from the outside, which are, are the guards that have to come in. Um, I know in Philly, um, at the women's uh, prison, um, they're locked down basically 23 and 1. They're they're one hour out, and that's either to take a shower or make a phone call. Um, the food that they're getting, um, we have reports of like spoiled milk. Um, and yeah, um, one of the, the uh, initiatives that we've started in Philly um, also is this card writing campaign to try to, um, you know, offer folks, you know, affirmations and support, but also keep a dialogue going with the women that are in, um, being impacted by this COVID crisis. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, in Philly, we've only had um, one death so far at the women's facility, but I can imagine that um, there are going to be more because the, the truth of the matter, matter is you can't social distance while you're in a cage. Um, it's just impossible to do. Sorry, did you say that I, I that they were locked down uh, in twenty three hours? As right, twenty three on one because a lot of the guards have self quarantined um, and they just don't have the the staff um, to let uh, women out on the block. So they're basically solitary confined and uh, only allowed to come out to and they have to choose between shower or phone call. Michelle, I know you, um, in the Art for Justice Network, you just recently posted about some work you were doing in Indiana, and I, I felt like it was also involving legislature, or reaching out to legislature. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, March 5th, we sent a letter to the governor asking him to recognize that COVID is coming and that he needs to decarcerate the prisons as soon as possible. And we outlined who was most at risk and who he could, you know, decarcerate with quickly. 
Um, he completely ignored that. And then we um, began to work with other people. Um, the Department of Correction offered us a list of everyone who was 365 days under or, or 65 years and older and uh, came up with a list of about 5,000 people. The state has roughly almost 30, a little bit of, around 30,000 30, people incarcerated. And we were like, okay. And they were, I think they gave us the data and we began to then analyze this data to figure out then what would be an emergency plan for those people. And we broke out into teams and we stayed up days and we figured out how we could quarantine those people if they let release them before we sent them home, before they went to a location. Um, it was a massive effort by a, a coalition of people in the city who, are, who care, mothers and fathers and daughters and friends. And um, we sent that along with a lot of, uh, a lot of information on the people that we knew who were from the Indian Women's Prison who were particularly ill, who needed to, who fit the criteria of being 65 years and over, but but were also particularly at risk. Um, the governor came out and with that and said that the we that people were quote safer inside. Since then, 92 percent of 92 uh, percent at Westville Correctional have tested positive for COVID, and. Um, COVID is in, at the facility that which I was at um, one of the women who several women who we knew who we put on a list who we said listen they are immune compromised they are most at risk these people will likely die both of them are at the, so two of those on that list are at the hospital now um, and are struggling for their lives and it's like at what point do you I mean, it, it's actually been very depressing and heartbreaking for me. Um, I stay in contact with my community in the side and to know that, that we are completely being ignored in these efforts is heartbreaking. What we've begun to do in, after those, after every single, you know, no, we kept, we've tried to find other things to do. And, and now we're working on individual cases, people, individual people trying to find them legal representation so that they can make legal, um, a, a, a legal uh, uh, request to their court, to their sentencing court, to release them because of their symptoms and their vulnerability to COVID. And um, it is a lot slower going. And uh, just kind of keep it up, lift it up in your energy and prayers, um, because it's it's been one of the most depressing things I've had to deal with since I've been home. Did you, with we, Did you say one facility hmm. had ninety two percent? 92% Westville Correctional is a men's facility and 92% have COVID. I mean, it's, it's like what I explained in the article that, that we, we, we did is that what you have created is kill boxes. And, and consciously, because we gave you the information, we gave you a plan, we gave you parts of things in which you needed to do. Yeah. I mean, which is, it's interesting because, um, you know, the reasons you listed should be reasons why folks should be, you know, freeing folks, but at the same time, they're also using that to not free people. Mm -hmm. Especially now that um, by saying the facilities that we let have it, right? Wow. Especially now that it's inside. They're like, oh, it's inside now, so we can't let anybody go. For fear that they will come out and in infect other people. Mm -hmm. But we had a quarantine plan. We provided them with that. Marriott to come into transitional not, housing. No one in yeah. them, right? And among other things, we found Catholic retreats. We found all kinds of places and spaces where people could be quarantined for two weeks. <laughs> all over this state. <laughs> so it's been frustrating. It's 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 just it's it's devastating. And it didn't have to go down this way. I period. Like in prison or outside of like New York. We didn't, I mean, it didn't have to go down this way, right? right? And it is showing racial capitalism in its kind of raw form, you know, about the disposability of certain lives. Absolutely. The Absolutely. Of certain lives. Um, I want to hear from you all as we wrap up, and thank you for this time. Just if, if there are, I know there's Mother's Day coming up and, and people doing um, interventions work specifically around Mother's Day. Um, and or any other ways that people who are listening to this 
um, can get involved, like concrete ways, especially because it's so overwhelming. I think a lot of people tune out because they're, it's just so depressing and it's so overwhelming. And I'm not saying that that absolves them, right? What are some really specific ways that people can get active or can help or can contribute? Thinking about what like we were talking about mutual aid societies and other, um, other forms of, of collective care. I think that donating is, and it makes it hard to ask for donations, especially when people aren't working. Um, but even if you don't have the money to donate to like the National Bell Out or the Bell Project or any of Michelle's organizations that actually need the funds to continue their work, just calling your governor, calling your mayor, calling your prosecutor and signing on to these different petitions, making your voice heard. Um, don't be silenced. Um, during this because the silence is what's going to keep us in this situation and keep our, our communities in prisons and dying inside. Um, so even if you don't have the money, I say just making your voice heard, making art, um, just doing something for forgetting about self for a while and thinking about people who have it worse. Because I hear a lot of people like, I'm so ready to go to out to eat. I'm so ready to go to the bar. But People inside are struggling. I'm ready to go out to eat too, but I go into that jail every week and I know that they are dying inside. So just like thinking outside of ourselves and putting our money where our mouth is and making our voices heard. Asia, can, what, what, just, can you repeat? I'm sorry. Did, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I didn't know if I was muted. Can you repeat the name of the organization that you work for? Just so people I work for I work for the Bell Project, and that website is bellproject.org. And also, there are many um, writing writing centers around Detroit that are struggling right now. Um, there's one in particular that I got my first fellowship at, called Room Project, and they are a writing space for women and non-binary writers, and they take special care of women of color, giving fellowships to four women every quarter and they aren't getting the small business loans or any of the, the government assistance that they need to keep going. And the members of the space, they are unemployed, so they can't give their member fees. So donating to those uh, types of organizations are, is also important. What's the name of it again, the writing group? It's called The Room Project. Room Project, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And we'll be sure to post all of this information, these resources on our website. So if you can just email them to me, we'll make sure that they're posted because I too, uh, after your um, conversation the other day, Nicole, um, was left just as I am now, um, just energized to do more. What can I do? And we know that everyone has uh, challenges, of, well, most everyone except the 1% has challenges around finances at this time However, there are so many other ways to be a support. And so I appreciate your providing information and links so that we can share it with our community as well. And Mary and Michelle, can you also just kind of list or enumerate uh, ways that people can be? Yeah, so um, folks that want to support um, specifically Black women, um, they can donate to nationalbellout.org. Um, um, they also can um, donate to phillybellout.com um, for the Black Mamas Bellouts, uh, trying to get as many uh, Black caregivers, mothers out uh, before Mother's Day. And you also can support the Dignity Act for PA.org. Um, and we, we, Dignity Act Now Collective, we're providing um, political education and other supports um, and involving the women that are being bailed out into this movement um, and keeping them engaged uh, and making sure they have the, uh, the resources that they need to sustain being free um, during this crisis. 